Hello, the practitioner here. Bachelor of Science student, chemistry major, math minor, magician, parapsych researcher, technical agnostic, and Fortean skeptic. Uh, this particular episode, I'm going to do something a little unusual and talk about um, some of the theories going around about UFOs and ancient technology and um, more particularly uh, a subject of mine which I haven't really breached on uh, that much um, but may have hinted at at some points, uh, science fiction. Um, my particular aspect of uh, the thing that always had me curious is the, uh, or more has fascinated me, is the constant relationship between science fiction and science fact. I mean, um, you know, uh, but, and also paradigm revolution in science. So the thing is that often a lot of ideas that used to be, um, that used to be uh, um, completely, uh, you know, that we take for granted now, used to be completely, uh, almost borderline fictionalized. Um, you know, there were people who said we never fly to the moon, and, you know, they, and people just redu um, uh, rejected the ideas of science fiction. But more importantly, um, I always feel like, you know, and I've already talked about paradigm battles before and like, but um, more importantly is, is my idea at how marvel, at the marvel of the human mind, and the uh, concepts that we can possibly generate from it. Um, I just came across a documentary, um, which was hosted by Eric Von Daniken, uh, as you probably know, is the guy who uh, wrote Chariots of the Gods, the idea of extraterrestrials coming to Earth. Um, and there's other Earth channel, there's been also a couple of other, uh, you know, various things about uh, how the, uh, the ancient Egyptians had batteries, like they apparently maybe found electricity in them. But here's the thing which really bugs me. I'm beginning to, the thing is that, I mean, you know, it's been possible that, uh, that extraterrestrials would come out. I mean, like, even I said, you know, it's, it's possible that my full vision of, uh, you know, angels and all that are all real, but, you know, even I still have to remain, you know, even on all that, I still have to remain skeptical. And primarily because of the fact that the, uh, one of the biggest debunks uh, of the possibility of extraterrestrials coming to Earth, um, and maybe the fact that they actually, that maybe the fact that even the humans either did have advanced technology or were highly competent, um, you know, at least in terms of, uh, at least in terms of extrapolation for basic science, maybe more so than we give them credit for, um, it is largely based on the fact that the most recent science fiction writers, um, I'm not talking the uh, class of, the, uh, of more recent work, but I'm talking like, you know, from the, not, the late 19th century onwards. Um, a couple of examples of this are Jules Verne, um, who was able to predict the helicopter uh, very effectively. Um, he was able to predict the um, submarine, uh, rough dimensions and size. He predicted the television camera. The, um, I think the only thing he didn't predict was actually the VCR, was the only thing he didn't predict. But, um, you know, I mean, like he predicted the TV camera, he predicted the uh, fax machine, he predicted the photocopier, uh, if memory serves. Um, oh, God, what else did he predict? God, there was a whole bunch of it. Um, there was only one of his pieces which I didn't particularly like, which was the idea of shooting a cannon to the moon. Um, his idea, what's ironic is that um, his particular uh, concept actually worked in theory, like mathematics was sound. The problem was he forgot to take into, the fact, into account the fact that uh, the humans can only withstand uh, seven gravities and only for short time periods of time. Um, uh, eight, uh, you know, if you're hyper But anyway, um, ironically, uh, Gerard K. O'Neill, a physics professor, um, a professor of physics and science fiction writer, um, later, um, uh, well, actually, he was more scientific speculation than science fiction, but anyway, um, he was the, uh, he was actually the uh, largest proponent for cosmography, the idea of, of colonization of space, um, colonizing the, the solar system, the asteroid belt. And he was the inventor of something known as the rail gun. Um, basically, what it was, it was a, a series of concentric magnets that would, um, that were computer time and would turn on and off consecutively, thus accelerating, um, whatever metal piece was in there. Um, the one that he had, the one that he designed on a scale model is now actually, um, it's now actually been applied in, um, in physics laboratories worldwide, uh, to, um, uh, to fire iron slugs at, uh, piles of dirt, or at a trace of dirt, to, um, imitate what might be happening when, um, meteorites hit the moon and, uh, form craters. But this piece of technology, was sufficiently powerful that it could accelerate a one kilo iron slug up to Mach 1.5 and back to zero in the length of a standard uh, university lecture table, which is about 40 feet. Um, you know, which, uh, you know, not you know, and that's pretty impressive. Um, but like I said, a mag uh, matter of fact, um, the designs have actually been uh, are actually now underway to be built by NASA for a uh, two mile long one, which would basically um, uh, run a uh, capsule in concentric uh, circles for up to of about uh, 10 to 15 gravities, and would actually fire off um, payloads in the lower orbit. And this would be for uh, mostly bulk uh, type, uh, this would be mostly for bulk type uh, uh, cargo. You know, expansions on the International Space Station, that sort of thing. But, um, you know, the thing 
means that the technology is entirely available uh, to do this. I'm actually going to have to run, by the way, just so you know, I'm going to have to run this clip for about uh, five, I'm going to have to run this train of thought for about five, six clips, because I really want to go in depth with this one. But um, uh, another example in more recent times was uh, Robert Hanson Heinlein. Um, he, of course, predicted the idea of a uh, atomic spacecraft that could have worked to uh, send a man to the moon. Um, uh, there was research into that in the 1980s uh, on a project called Nerva, but it actually got shut down because of um, certain environmental uh, elements. Uh, people who didn't actually understand the, um, who didn't actually understand the real, uh, you know, how far the dangers were, you know, didn't entirely understand the science of uh, nuclear physics or, uh, you know, how much danger of radiation there actually was from a nuclear rocket. I had the project shut down. And granted, at the time, the controls that they had in terms of uh, radiation shielding like, were not sufficient. But we should have at least, uh, rather than just shutting down the protocol altogether, um, we should have actually more seriously researched that as a possibility. Because um, you know, if atomic rockets could end up um, uh, better, um, you know, becoming superior to uh, standard chemical rockets, we might be able to make um, interplanetary trips, uh, say, out to the uh, asteroid belt, like more effective uh, or more, um, you know, cost effective. Well, again, you know, it's one of uh, the possible option for uh, consideration. Um, the uh, developing a railgun, um, you know, building a railgun uh, roughly 500 miles long, uh, 300 miles long, up the side of one of the Andes Mountains is also um, another subject worth looking into. But anyway, I, I digress. Another aspect of Robert Gass and Heinlein's work. In the novel Space Cadet, um, he, um, there's a scene where the main character is just about to enter the academy uh, and is about to uh, get into a rocket, get shipped up uh, the top side, uh, the top side of uh, all Earth orbit, um, where he was going to be starting to be trained to do work in zero G. Um, you know, basically, it was, a, it, was a, it, was a parting, uh, it was a parting space station uh, science academy. Anyway, he gets in, uh, he's getting into the academy, and one of his friends hears a ring from his pocket. He opens it up, flips it open, he goes, hello, you know, and basically, literally, and the, and the description is actually quite specific. Robert Heinlein, back in 1970, at, um, or actually it was in 1960, um, I've got to get my copy on the, uh, on the handset all again. But the bottom line is, though, is that long before the cell phone actually even came out, Robert Heinlein predicted with remarkable accuracy the workings and mechanisms of a modern day cell phone. Not, not including the internet, but you know, um, but, you know a modern day cell phone. Uh, like, the one from 2000, um, you know, not, you know, like, one of the simple ones. He actually predicted it with remarkable accuracy, you know, and now Robert Heinlein, to his credit, was a mechanical engineer at the time. He had been a, uh, um, he had been an engineer for the Navy before he retired and started writing science fiction. Actually, he was one of the better uh, science fiction writers of his day. H.P. Piper was another. But, um, you know, he has Gasmoff. I mean, uh, Asimov and Carl Sagan, too, uh, wrote, well, Carl Sagan also does this, but that's not surprising. But the point is that science fiction and, and the um, you know science fiction even by the worst levels, you know, by people who only have like the most basic of mathematics and physics at the time, were able to predict some incredible um, scientific developments which we now take for granted today. Um, you know, the uh, the electronic uh, you know, uh, you know like you know the telephone, the internet, the um, I don't even remember who predicted the internet. But anyway, long story short, um, there's there are quite a few examples of this. So um, this leads me to my possible, to my next possible question. Well, is it possible that um, some original ancestors of ours um, got their hands on enough technical, enough basic science and mathematics to be able to predict uh, some very uh, interesting effects in terms of technology for today? Um, one particular example which I found interesting about this was uh, this one I saw uh, again hosted by Eric von Däniken. It actually showed um, two particular pieces that had been found in an Inca tomb around 800 BC, uh, if memory serves. Yeah, right here on BC. And these two uh, were gold amulets that uh, archaeologists have said look like we're supposed to be in these two revered insects. But here's a thought for you. The Incans, like the Mayans, were one of the most advanced technological species, of, uh, not sorry, technological species, technological, um, technological nations of their time period. And the thing is, is that if one actually observed birds for long enough, you know, um, for example, the um, Dunnikin was very good in pointing out. And insects mostly have their, their wings on the tops of their bodies. Birds, however, do not, and are actually very similar, and are actually in the exact same position as they would be on an airplane. But here's the thing. What if, rather than just making it as a sheer reference, some, uh, you know, some uh, uh, priest or what have you, carved that out as not only as an imitation of birds, but possible extrapolation of what humans could do? I mean, um, uh, I'll get to more in the next video, because it's interesting.